And today we're kicking off a brand new series for the month of June called Faithful. And you've already figured out that this series is going to just be a little bit different. Um, I, I want to just give you a few few uh, thoughts about the series. Uh, it's going to be focusing on answering four critical questions that, that I think we should all be asking about our faith. Uh, the series is going to be a family series. So our children and students are focusing on the same thing adults are for the entire month of June, which is why today you've already seen some things different about how worship looks like on a Sunday morning for the month of June. So we're excited to kind of pull everybody in the family together around one idea, one theme, uh, common teaching. And so moms and dads out there, this is gonna give you a lot of opportunities to, to engage in wonderful conversations ask good questions around your dinner tables and just spend time talking with your children about what we're discussing here at church. Um, so if I could give you uh, the point of this series in one sentence, okay, here, here it is right here. God's people are to be both full of faith and faithful. So think of that word faithful in the series two ideas behind it. First of all, God wants us to be full of faith. That's another way of saying God wants us to trust Him completely. But He also wants us to be faithful. Another way we might say that is God wants us to be dependable. He wants to be able not only for us to trust Him, God wants to trust us so that we're faithful in what he asks us to do. So today, as we, we jump into the series, we're going to begin with this first question. And it, it's a big question. What do you believe that you can't see? Now, just take a moment, look at that question, read it again, because that, that's really a big, bold question. What do you believe that you can't see. Now there's a verse of Scripture. It's found in the book of Hebrews. And for this month of June, we want you to memorize this verse. It's Hebrews 11.1. 1. And it's, it's kind of the springboard verse for this whole month of teaching. So here's what Hebrews 11.1 1 says. Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we don't see. Now, notice I've highlighted four words, hope and do not see. Faith, what is faith? Well, faith is confidence in what we hope for. It's assurance. That is, it is a deep trust that something we don't see is real. Now, let me illustrate it in this way. Can I tell you, I have never seen oxygen. It's all around me, everywhere, but I've never seen it because it's invisible. But let me tell you how much I believe that oxygen is real. I believe it so much that I just keep breathing. I believe every breath I take, oxygen is going to be there. In fact, oxygen, which I can't see, is necessary for me to live. If oxygen were taken away from me or from you, you realize this very short period of time that we can live without oxygen. I would tell you oxygen, so, so, and you're going to believe this with me, oxygen is far impo more important than your house or your car. And you're like, yeah, right on, Pastor Mark. I could, I could actually live without my car. In fact, some of you are saying, I'd like to live without my car right now. But you can't live without oxygen. I, I illustrate it to say this. Sometimes the things that are most important are things we can't see. And sometimes our world gets that all backwards. They make things that we see much more important than they actually are. And the things we can't see are actually the most important. 
Because, for example, how many of you have ever seen, you've seen love? I mean, you like, oh, yeah, that's love. But we haven't actually seen love, but yet we know love when we see it displayed. And we're like, oh, wow, that's love. How do we know that? Well, because it's so vital. But it's this invisible thing. So, so in, these open, in, the, in this opening verse of Hebrews 11, the writer of Hebrews has given us a definition of faith that is both concise and challenging. Now, go, let's go back to the verse because I want you to see it one more time. So think of this. This is a definition of faith from a biblical perspective. Faith, what, what faith is, it's confidence in what we hope for. It's the assurance about what we do not see. Now, I want you to notice there, there's a close relationship in this verse between faith and hope. Now, we spent the whole, whole month of May, just talking about hopeful and and how important hope is. And now we're going to talk about faithful. So faith and hope are really, really, they're, they're like brother and sister. They are so closely connected in terms of biblical understanding. Uh, they're not synonyms, but they're close to synonyms. So that's why I like to call them a brother and sister. They're not twins, but they are closely related to each other. So there's this close relationship between faith and hope. Also, we see in this verse something important, really important. Faith is more about what we don't see than it is about what we do see. Now, I need to let that kind of rest with you for just a moment. Faith is more about what we don't see than it is about what we do see. Now, the rest of Hebrews 11, which we refer to this chapter in the New Testament as the great faith chapter of the Bible. In the rest of the chapter, we're given the names of, I will call several of our ancestors in the faith, who modeled the kind of faith that's just been described or defined for us in Hebrews 11.1. 1. So what, what we're going to do for the next few minutes, we're going to look at a few of those names. We're not going to look at all of them in Hebrews chapter 11, because, because frankly, I don't have time this morning to cover every one of those names. But we're going we're gonna to highlight on a few of those names. And we're going to ask, when we look at their name, what did they believe that they couldn't see. But also, what do they believe that perhaps others around them can't see? Okay. So we're going to start out with a very interesting name. Uh, not, not the most familiar name to everyone. Enoch. The name of Enoch. Now, I, I want to get clear about who Enoch is. There are two men named Enoch that are mentioned in the book of Genesis. The first is mentioned in Genesis chapter 4, and he is the son of Cain and the grandson of Adam and Eve. This is not the Enoch the writer of Hebrews is talking about. Uh, Adam and Eve have another son. His name is Seth. We read about Seth in Genesis chapter 5, and when we go down the names of the the descendants in his family, one of his descendants is a man named Enoch. And we read about him in Genesis 5, 21 to 24. And here's what it says in Genesis. When Enoch had lived 65 years, he became the father of Methuselah. Now, he's an interesting guy. This is all I want to say. In terms of recorded biblical names and lifespans. Methuselah lives longer than anyone that we have recorded. So his father is the Enoch we're talking about. So after Enoch became the father of Methuselah, Enoch, Enoch walked faithfully with God. Now, now notice that word faithfully. He walked faithfully with God 300 years and he had other sons and daughters. We're not told their names, but he had other sons and daughters. Maybe a lot. I mean, the guy had 300 and some years to work on this, folks. So he could have had a lot of sons and daughters. Uh, uh, just a little biblical humor there for you. Altogether, Enoch 
lived a total of 365 years. Now here's the interesting statement about Enoch. Enoch walked faithfully with God. This is the thing that's outstanding about him. He walked faithfully with God. Then he was no more because God took him away. In other words, he didn't physically die. God translated him from earth to heaven without physical death happening. Now, now you say, Pastor Mark, I don't understand that. Please explain it. So here's my answer. I don't fully understand it either, so I can't explain it. But we are told more than once in recorded inspiration in Scripture that this was the truth about Enoch, that he didn't die. He was just taken from earth to heaven, and he walked faithfully with God. So, so here's my question. What is it that Enoch believed that so many people around him couldn't see? So here's what I think it was, that we can have a close and personal walk or relationship with God. Now, obviously, Enoch had a very close and personal relationship with God. I mean, twice we're told he just walked and lived faithfully with and for God. You know, I was thinking about this and thinking about Enoch and what the Bible says about him in the book of Genesis. If, if at the end of my life, I would want people to say something about me and how I had lived. I can't think of anything I would rather have people be able to say honestly than this. You know, Mark walked faithfully with God. That, that's a pretty good way for people to be able to sum up your life. You walked faithfully with God. That you lived in a close and personal relationship with the Lord over the course of your lifetime. And Enoch was able to see this. He believed he could have a very intimate, personal relationship with God. And their relationship was so close, God just said, Enoch, I'm just going to bring you home without death. That's pretty incredible. Well, hey, the next person we meet is a name you're probably going to recognize. You may have not have recognized Enoch, but you recognize this name. He's probably one of the more well-known names anywhere in the Bible. Noah. And you're like, everybody, yeah, yeah, he's the guy who built the big boat, right? He built, he built the ark. And think about this. Noah lives at a time when God looks at the world and God says, wow, I created this world and I created the people in my own image to live in relationship with me. And like, they reject me. Why did, why did I create the world as I did? So this is this thing of God kind of questioning in himself, which that, that'll give your theology a little something to grapple with. But, but, God, but God looks at all of this. In fact, God says, you know, I think we'll just end it. I just think that that's all. We'll just close it down. Because everyone's just doing what they think's right in their own eyes. They're not even paying attention to me. But there was one exception, Noah. And we're told Noah found favor. He found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And when the Lord looked at Noah, he thought, well, you must not, there is one person there listening to me. Noah is listening to me. And what does God say to Noah? Noah, I want you to build this ark. In fact, God is so specific, he gives him the full blueprint for the ark. He tells him all the dimensions and exactly the type of wood he's supposed to use. And God says, Noah, build this ark. Now, you've got to put yourself kind of in Noah's place and think, what if you, you have this great sense in you? I'm told to go out here. I live kind of in the middle of a place where there is no water. And I'm being told to build a big boat because a lot of water is coming. And I'm going to do this simply because God told me to. Uh, put yourself in Noah's neighbor's shoes. What do you think they said of Noah as he 
began the project of building an ark. I think he got a lot of ridicule. Uh, there was no uh, late night TV during those days, but if there had been late night TV during those days, I think the prominent joke line on all late night television would be, has everybody heard about that guy, that crazy nutty guy over in the Middle East who kind of lives in this place that's kind of like a desert, and he's building a great big boat in the middle of the desert because a lot of water's coming, and he's doing this all because he heard some voice he said is God, and it told him to do this, and he said God gave him all the blueprints, and when he does all of this, a bunch of animals are going to come and get on it, and God's going to use it to save him and his family and preserve humanity. What a crazy, nutty dude is that, right? That would have been the story of Noah. He would have been the punchline in all the jokes. But you know what? Noah believed something. Listen, look at this. Obey what God tells you, even if the whole world ridicules you. He is the first person to obey God. And the world ridiculed. But he heard God and he believed what God had said, even though he couldn't see it. And he built the ark. And we read the rest of the story. And God indeed saved the human human race through Noah and his family. So that's Noah. Here's the next one. You'll recognize this name as well. It's Abraham. Abraham. We call him the father of faith. Now, Now, Abraham like Noah, is given kind of a crazy word from God. Actually, Abraham grew up in this place. He lived in a place that was called Ur of the Chaldees. Now, I've never been to Ur of the Chaldees, but it was a real place, and this was his home. And God comes to Abram, as he was called in those days. He comes to Abram, and he says, hey, Abram, I want to do something really special in your life. In fact, I want to send you to a special place. It's called the promised land. And so I want you to leave here where your home is. And I want you to go to a place I'm going to show you. And uh, you've got to think, Abram, well, where is this place? And God just say, I'll show you when you get there. I just need you to leave now and go with me and follow me wherever I lead you. Now, I don't know exactly how long it took Abram to reach the decision, but he reached the decision, and this is what he believed. Look at this. Go where God sends you, even if God hasn't told you where it's at. Now you say, Pastor Mark, that's crazy. That's crazy. Maybe, maybe not, because in Hebrews 11, we're told that Abraham was looking for something. Look at how the writer of Hebrews says it. He was looking forward to a city with foundations whose architect and builder was God. In other words, he's looking for the place God wants him. Are you looking for the place where God wants you to be? Are you willing to go wherever God leads you? You say, well, Pastor Mark, that was, that was Old Covenant. That was Abram. God would never ask us to do that. Now... Are you sure about that? Because I want to have a conversation. You and Jesus. Here's how it goes, all right? Here's Jesus, all right? Here's his first word. Follow me. That's what he said. Follow me. You respond, where to? Here's Jesus' answer. Wherever I lead you. Now think about that. That's pretty similar to what God said to Abram. Follow me, Abram, where to God, wherever I lead you. You see, Christian discipleship is very similar to that. We follow Jesus. Well, where? Well, wherever he leads us. When when I started following Jesus many years ago, I had no idea all the places that would lead me in my life. But part of that is right here, being in Springfield, Ohio today. I've, I've served God in Mississippi and Indiana and Missouri and Kansas and now here we are in Ohio. I had no idea my life would take all of those interesting twists and turns because once you start following Jesus you never know exactly wherever he might lead you. And you say, well, oh, Pastor Mark, I, I'm not, not going to be a pastor so I won't, that, that won't be true of me. You know, that may be true, but you know right here in Springfield, 
I think Jesus would like to lead you and me to some places right inside our own city that we're a little hesitant to go to. Maybe in the times we're living in right now, maybe we need to say to Jesus, Jesus, you lead me wherever you want me to go, right even inside our own city. You know, church, he may take you and me personally, but also he may take us together to some places and to some neighborhoods where you say, well, I didn't think we would ever go there. Maybe it's time for us to follow Jesus there. Maybe we need to be a little like Abram and go wherever he leads us. Now this next name, he's one of my favorites, Moses, the prince of Egypt. If you watch the Disney movie, it's Moses. He looked a lot like Charleston, Charlton Heston. And he had a voice a lot like Charlton Heston. I'm quite convinced of that. Uh, He's the best Moses ever. I don't know what the real Moses was like. Not really. But he was a man who learned to believe what he couldn't see. Here's the outstanding thing. Here's something he learned. Look at this. It's better to be faithful to God and enjoy his favor than it is to try to please people and enjoy their favor. We're told that in Hebrews 11. This is true about Moses. It's better to be faithful to God and to please God and get his favor than it is to try to please people and get their favor. (laughs) Can I tell you, we get this all backwards. We usually start on the side, well, let's try to please people and get their favor. and Hopefully in the process, we'll please God. That's all wrong. Real discipleship is let's be faithful to God and please him. And hopefully in the process, people will be pleased and we will have their favor as well. I've always figured this out. If someone withholds their favor from me because I'm doing what pleases God, then I really ne- I didn't need their favor to begin with. You see, I, I, I can live without another person's favor. I cannot live without God's favor. And Moses figured that out. See, it's better to be faithful to God and his, to receive his favor. Well, one more name, one more name. He's a great one. David, the great king of Israel, King David. He's mentioned, his name's mentioned in Hebrews 11. And here's an outstanding thing. David believed that he couldn't see. Here it is. There's no giant so large that in God's power we cannot overcome it. Now, now David's probably the story he's most known for is his encounter with the giant Goliath, the Philistine. Everyone else was scared of Goliath. In fact, King Saul and all of the armies of Israel were cowering in fear because of Goliath. And then this shepherd boy named David shows up and he's like, why are we so afraid of this guy? If God is with us, nothing can stand against us. And he said, I'll go face him. (laughs) Long story short, I'm not going to go into all the details. I don't have time. But he goes out with a a shepherd's staff with a slingshot and five stones. And he faces Goliath. And miraculously, he overcomes the giant Goliath. You see, he was able to believe what nobody else could see. And even he couldn't see at first. That there's no giant so large that in God's power, we can't overcome it. So what are, what are the giants in your life you need to overcome? You see, today... I think we need to to look at the moment we're in. What is it we need to believe right now, this very moment that we can't see? So I'm going to name four things real quickly. We need to believe right now that we can't fully see. Here they are. Here's the first one. The COVID-19 virus crisis will one day come to an end. I know it's hard to see that. It's like... This has only been going on just two or three months. Can I tell you the truth? It feels like two or three years to me. I'm here, first Sunday of June, preaching to this camera, looking forward to when we're going to be back together. And it is going to happen soon. 
it feels like it's been two or three years since we were together. Not, not two or three months. But we need to believe something we can't see. The virus is going to end one day. The crisis will be over. Here's the second thing. America can overcome our historic racial divides and be truly united again. That's a little hard to see and believe right now with what's going on in our nation. But yet, I believe that with all of my heart. I believe nothing's impossible with God. And I believe God wants us to be united and to be one. I believe God wants us to overcome our historic racial divides. I believe God wants this to be the generation of reconciliation and peace. Not the, not the generation that's two or three generations from now, but right now we have a catalytic moment in history to turn the tide and perhaps solve a problem that for 250 years of our history we've not been able to solve. In fact, even longer than that, it goes clear back to the colonial days. But we can do it. Here's the third thing. I, be I believe this, even though I can't see it right now. The church can have a spiritual revival of historic magnitude. I believe we have an opportunity, church, to have an historic revival. And here's the fourth thing. I love this. I, I can't see it yet, but, but I believe it's possible. America can have a spiritual awakening where millions come to faith in Jesus. Now, when I was praying about how I communicate this to you, I first per put the word thousands in there. And the Holy Spirit just got all over my case. He said, Mark, what do you mean a spiritual awakening where thousands come to faith in Jesus? No, this land can have a spiritual awakening not where thousands, but where millions come to Jesus. You can't see it, but can you believe it? It's possible. Well, as I begin to wrap down, see the opening verses of Hebrews 12, they tell us who makes this real faith possible. So I'm going to read the opening verses, and then when we get to verse 2, verse 2 is going to show up on the screen, and you're going to see who it is that makes this faith possible. Hebrews 12 begins, Well, therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, and by the way, the great cloud of witnesses is everyone mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11. We're surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses, so let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily tangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Now here it is. Don't miss this. Look at this. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. There it is, friends. The source of the faith we're talking about in the month of June is Jesus. He's the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith. So here's a question I want to ask. What did Jesus believe that others couldn't see? They couldn't see it, but Jesus believed it. And he was obedient to God as a result. Here it is. Jesus believed that if he gave his life for us, out of love, death could not hold him. And we would be made fully alive through his death and resurrection. Jesus believed that. That's why he obeyed God and went to the cross. He knew it was all in God's hands and that if he would obey God, this would be the result. So I want to end today with this wonderful reminder to us from the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 4.18. So here's 2 Corinthians 4.18. Look at, look at this verse. So we fix our eyes. You know, we fix them on Jesus. And Paul says we fix our eyes not on what is seen. And by the way, I haven't seen Jesus yet. I will see him one day, but I haven't seen him yet. But I fix my eyes. You should fix your eyes. We should fix our eyes together not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is what? It's temporary. But what is unseen, Jesus and everything he promises is eternal. 
So for this first Sunday, as we start off with a series, Faithful, here's my challenge. Here it is. Do this. Let's fix our eyes on Jesus. I mean, let's focus our faith on Jesus today. And you say, well, what will happen, Pastor Mark, if we do this right here? We can't go wrong if we allow him to lead us together. Fix our eyes on him. Let him lead us. We can't go wrong, church. Let's pray. God, very simple prayer today that you help us, your people at Maiden Lane, to do this one thing today. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus. Let's fix our eyes on not what's seen, but what is unseen. Not on what is temporary, but on what is eternal. Knowing, God, that when we fix our eyes there, we can't go wrong because Jesus leads us together. Lord, that's our prayer for us, but it's our prayer for our nation right now and for our world. More than anything, what we need to do is fix our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith. Amen. Love you guys.